We're going to that to the Hills Nursing Home. Just some people to keep on our prayers uh, on our prayer list this morning. Is of course remember Jonathan and Destiny and Grayson and Jillian. Uh, all I can say this morning is getting closer. Uh, it's 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 getting closer. And on what is today? Today's the eighth. So yesterday they were four months old. And Grayson is uh, a little over ten pounds, and Jillian is about eight between eight and nine pounds. So big brother has actually outgrown little little sister. And. Wow, that was right weird. <laughs> so we need to remember uh, Grayson and Jillian uh, and Jonathan and Destiny. Rachel's up there with them. She went up back up with them this morning um, just to help out with, with getting some things together. So just on the list of uh, people that we need to keep on our prayer list, uh, Sammy Watson, Jack Phipps, Roland Nix, who is home, Joe Murphy, he, let's keep him. Do you have an update? He's still hospitalized. Okay, at this time he's still hospitalized. Uh, uh, we need to keep Julie Watson, David Lundry, uh, Riley Matthews, which is Tanya Grobel's niece, and Peter, who is a friend of Roland and Barbara Nix. So uh, we need to keep those on our prayer list. And we have one more. Yes, ma'am. My has COVID. Oh, no, okay. So, so Brenda's daughter, Shelly, uh, has COVID. Uh, and so we need to keep pray for her. Uh, if you've never seen the work that Shelly does, it's absolutely incredible. Uh, her and Sammy could go into an art contest together, and it would be very close. I mean, it would it, that, that might be fun to do. So, uh, so yeah, Shelly has got COVID. Anyone? Any, any, uh, let me get that out. Any others? The Judy Hill family. The Judy Hill family. Okay. Yes. Any others? Mitch and Rhonda Bishop. Mitch and Rhonda Bishop, yes, please keep them in your prayers. Any others? Yes, Avery. Yes, we announced a week ago that Avery was at the hospital with his grandmother. She did pass away. And so uh, so let's remember his family uh, uh, with the passing of his grandmother. So I know that's, uh, uh, and we all know what it's like to lose a family member. So uh, so you guys give Avery a hug today afterwards or go and just go over and shake his hand. Any others? Remember my birthday both had his brother Daniel Monday. Okay, say again. My school, they both had his brother Daniel Monday. Okay. A few a funerals on Monday. Okay, funerals on Monday. Yes. All right. Let's remember that. Anything? Anyone else? All right. Let's have a word of prayer, and we will continue with our time together. Father, we thank you for this day, and Father, we are so blessed to be here as family. Father, we thank you for, for just being able to gather together, and for the beautiful sunshine and the wonderful weather you've blessed us with. Father, we, 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 we take you for granted so many times, but we thank you for being in control. Father, we pray that you would be with us as we as as we as we gather here. May the words that are that are sung be, be words straight from our hearts to offer that wonderful sacrifice to you. May the words that Rodney speaks this morning, Father, be your words, and may they be words, Father, that pierces our hearts to to encourage us to look even more to you. Father, I just pray with you that you would be with people across this nation, across this world. And I pray, Father, that you would just watch over everyone. And Father, a very special prayer at this time that you'd be with those who have lost loved ones. I pray, Father, prayers of comfort, of peace, of strength. That you may surround their, them and, and their families with your loving arms. Today, Father, as, as we enter in time of a commun of communion, may we remember this is not only for us, but it's for you. And we do this together to honor you and your son. Thank you once again for all the blessings. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <laughs> what a fellowship.
We've come to our time this morning where we will be partaking of the Lord's Supper together. A lot of times when we think about the Lord's Supper, there's a lot of things that we can have in our minds as, as we partake of it. But one of the things I wanted to mention this morning is this. What is it in your mind that makes a good gift or makes the gift memorable to you? And, and when I think about that, I, I think about not really so much what the gift is, although I may enjoy the gift, but I think a lot about the person who gave the gift to me and what they may have sacrificed. may not have been a lot even monetarily. But what they may have sacrificed or the thoughts that they may have had whenever they were getting that gift together for me. That they had me in mind whenever they created the gift, got the gift, or handed the gift to me. And that means probably the older I've gotten in life that means a whole lot more to me than exactly what the gift may have been. But when we think about the gift of Jesus, and we know what Jesus went through on our behalf. His willingness to give his life for us. His, his shedding of his blood. The beating that he took. The death uh, that he suffered. The death that none of us probably will ever experience. But when we think about that gift, also I think about that gift giver. And, and we think about God in that case. And what was it that God did? He had us in mind, didn't he, when he, when he gave us that gift. He had us in mind from, from before we were ever thought of uh, in an earthly sense. Now, he, he knew about us before we ever were born. He knew what our needs were. And he gave his all whenever he gave the gift to us. So that gift should mean something to us from that standpoint. Mark talks about, about this gift. And Mark talks about it from the standpoint that it, it's, it's a covenant. And when we partake of the Lord's Supper together, we're partaking in a covenant that God has with us. That we are his children, that we can approach him directly. That he has given his all, shed his blood for us, so that we can be his and be his for eternity. So we have that covenant relationship with and when we think about it from, from Luke's perspective, you know, Luke, Luke talks about taking, taking of this Lord's Supper together so that it is in remembrance of Jesus, so that we don't forget him. And we think about all these 2,000 plus years that have, have gone by since his death on the cross, since the shedding of that blood, his sacrifice. What helps, what helps us to remember that? Each week we partake of this Lord's Supper together. Take of the bread, it represents his body. Take of the fruit of the vine, it represents his blood. So that we remember exactly what that sacrifice was, at least from our perspective. And we understand the importance of that gift. Because without it, we would be lost for eternity. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for the gift that you gave us. The gift of the sacrifice of your son, the shedding of that blood, that horrible death that he went through, his body hanging on that cross, Father, taking all of our sins with him so that we don't have to have those sins hanging on us where we would suffer that eternal death if we accept him and put him on in baptism and understand that it only through the shedding of that blood do we have any hope of Father, thank you for, for that life. Thank you for that death. And thank you for this bread that represents his body. Just three minutes we pray.
Let's pray again together. Father, again, we approach your throne thanking you again for, for your son. And Father, that, that blood was precious. It was pure. There was no sin in the life of Jesus. And we know that that blood cleanses us from, from our sin. We know you've told us that if we are walking in the light and continue to walk in the light, then that blood will continually cleanse us. There's power in the blood. And Father, we're so thankful for that blood and, and the spilling of that blood on the cross and how precious it is to us. Thank you for that. It's through your son that we pray. I also want to take a moment to think about our offering uh, back to the work that continues even to this day. We, we were tasked with a commission. And that commission was to uh, seek and save the lost. And you know there are a lot of ways that, that we can go about that. We, we can personally go, and we should be personally going each day. We can send people. There are examples of people being sent. There is work to do. Work to do. Jesus even pointed out uh, in his in his teaching, you know, that, that the fields are white for the harvest, and, that, and that's the way it was two thousand years ago when Jesus was here. You know, those fields are still white. It takes harvesters, and that's what we are also commissioned to do. Part of the way that we do that is giving back of our means to help in that work. And so we have an opportunity now as well to give back, to give back monetarily. And, and, and 
that's what we're talking about this morning, that monetary gift back. It's not about an amount, but it is about a sacrifice. It is about what is your heart like. It is about making that statement that I am going to be about the work that Jesus has commissioned me to be about. So as we think this morning about that, uh, it's a time that we we spend in taking a, a contribution together to help support that work. There are a couple of ways here that, that we can do that, and one is we have a, table, a, a tray on the table in the back that you can leave your contribution there, or you can you can uh, give your contribution through Tithely uh, and out uh, if you desire to do it that way. But either way, uh, a contribution is, is necessary in order for the work to continue through our congregation. But making that sacrifice is also a part of what we've been instructed to do as well. So if you would, let's pray together as, as we think about our work here. Father, thank you so much again for the gift that you've given us. Help us to continually remember that, that we have a commission, and that's to be about your work, working to find those lost souls, helping to bring them into, into your kingdom, Father. Be with us as we give back to the work. We ask, Father, that we do so willingly, cheerfully, that we give of, of, of our means, and that we see it as a sacrifice because you have sacrificed for us. We ask, Father, that you will bless the, the work that's done here and that we will be working to find and seek and save those who are lost. Thank you again for your son and what he means to us. It's through him that we pray. Amen. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let His praises ring. Glory in the highest and will shout and sing. Standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, standing on the promises of God.
seven times in the book of, of Revelation, and we're going to look at the first one today. And Kaysen's going to come up here and read the scripture for us. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which gave God him to show to his servants the things that must soon take place, he made it known by sending his angels to his servant, who bore with witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw blessed is the one who reads aloud, aloud the words of his prophecy. And blessed are these who hear and keep what is written in it for the time is near. Alright, very good. Alright, thank you, Casey. There it is, and now some of you astute observers may be noticing that that was the same text that we read last week, and you may be thinking, you know, at this pace if we're doing the same text week in and week out, it really is going to be a long series. Uh, that's really not going to happen week in and week out, but this prologue here to the book is really important. And, and, and so we're going we're gonna to really zero in on, on verse 3 there. But I do want to mention that it is it's helpful to look at the prologue, but then also go back or actually go forward in the book of Revelation to chapter 22. I believe it's verses 6 and following. And we're not going to take the time to do that this morning, but it it's, they're almost meant to be read together. You've got the beginning and you've got the end, and the same themes are picked up in both places. Uh, that first word, I, I know the first word's the, but the first word in, in the Greek is, is that word revelation. And in the Greek, it's apocalypse, right? And that means, as I mentioned last week, it's the revealing. That's why we get this, this word revelation. It's revealing something that's hidden. Okay, so. It's almost like, in some ways, it's revealing what is hidden in plain sight. That, that happens a lot of times, right, just in, generally in life. If you've ever, uh, you know, we, we like to ride around up in the mountains, and uh, Julie's liable to, she's better at spotting deer than I am. And uh, not riding around hunting, okay, just, I'm going <laughs> to clear that up right now. But, um. She'd love to see a deer standing there. Stop, stop, stop. There's a deer. Mm -hmm. I'm looking. I back up. I'm looking. I'm looking. I'm looking. And then all of a sudden, maybe it twitches an ear or something. And, and what was right there in plain sight was hidden to me because I couldn't see it. But then I see it. Uh, sometimes that happens in a negative way, with like with a snake. 
Uh, you, you see those pictures on Facebook sometimes where they say, there's a snake in this picture, and it, it, it's hard to, to find it. It's, it's hidden, and then it's revealed. Uh, you can think of this, uh, the book of Revelation, like a curtain, and there's truth there that has that's been hidden. And in a lot of ways, it's in plain sight, but God is pulling back the curtain, and he's showing us some things that are really important. And it was important for those first century hearers of the word, but it's also really important for us today in the, the 21st century. Um, notice the process. I, I think this is important for us to, to keep in mind. You've got this, this process of revelation. Okay, It's the word from God to Jesus, to the angel, to John, and then to the servants. And, and by the way, servants is, is key uh, there. This is a message that is primarily for the servants of the Lord Jesus. Okay, and it's, it's, a, it's a message that they needed to, to hear. Uh, you've got uh, angels figuring uh, very prevalently in not only this process, but really in the entire book. In fact, in Revelation 67 times, Angels are mentioned. And, and so, in some ways, it reminds us, remember when we studied Daniel earlier this year, and we have God working, right, communicating a message through angels, and angels show up, shows up and gives Daniel a message. Well, it, this is very similar, okay? We have in similar books, similar messages, in fact. But the process is similar. It, it goes, it's mediated through angels to the servant of God, in, in this case, John, who then writes it down for the servants of God. I think it is important for us to maybe ask the question, why does God communicate this way? Why, why does it go through a process like this? And, and, and maybe we're even tempted to say, why does, why does God rely on other mediators, and particularly human mediators, to get across his, his word? Why don't he just, just speak it from heaven and just, just tell us what he wants us to know? Well, first off, God knows what he's doing. Uh, we, we, we need to be careful about questioning him, but... He's actually done that before. Now there's, there's recording in Scripture. Uh, John chapter 12, I believe it is, where a voice, and, and a couple of times during Jesus' ministry, but particularly in this, on this occasion, he spoke from heaven. A voice spoke from heaven. And not only did Jesus hear it, but the people around him heard what he said. And then what did they do? They argued about whether that was a voice or not. Okay? God has spoken as, as a in an audible voice before. And those who had ears to hear heard, and those who didn't didn't. And I think it's amazing that God chooses different beings from angels. To humans to communicate his word. There's a process there. He joined, he invites us to as humans to join him in the work that he's about. And I just think that's that's amazing that he lets us be co-laborers with him. If you're a parent or a grandparent, you know that it's kind of cool sometimes to get your kids to help you with a task at hand, right? Uh, you want them to learn and you want them to, to grow and you want them to experience. But you also know that sometimes that makes the task more difficult, right? And, and we're tempted sometimes to do things like, oh, just let me do it myself. Thank God may be tempted to, to do that sometimes with us. But anyway, he joined, he, he invites us to join him in, in the process. 
One more thing here about, about angels. Literally, they're, they're messengers. That, that's what the, the word means. Uh, they are absolutely amazing beings. Um, you know that, but, but we really don't know that either, I, I don't think. I, I don't know about you, but I've never seen an angel. But they're absolutely amazing. The, the two most common things angels say in Scripture is, number one, don't be afraid, fear not. So when an angel shows up and a human sees the angel, they're scared because an angel in its glory is absolutely amazing, so amazing that it's frightening. So that's the, one of the, the most common things that angels say in Scripture is don't be afraid. The other is kind of related to it. It's get up on your feet, stand up. And I think it's related because sometimes it scares people so bad they faint, I believe. But I think the other thing is when people see angels in their glory, they believe that the natural response is to worship. And angels are not to be worshipped, and they recognize that. They understand that. Get up on your feet. I'm, I'm an angel. We worship God. And so angels are, are absolutely amazing. But what's so amazing is as we, especially as we go through the book of Revelation, we note that Angels are giving their allegiance and their worship to God. These amazing, powerful, tremendously powerful beings, and their allegiance and their worship is all directed towards God. If you don't think an angel, that angels are powerful, y'all remember Genesis 18, Genesis 19, where God sends two angels to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. Two cities, two angels. They're powerful. And so angels are, they're worthy of, of study and they're worthy of better understanding perhaps by us, but they're not worthy of worship. They, they actually are, they model for us the worship of, of God. All right. We want to key in on, on verse three here. And the title of, of today's message is how bad do you want a blessing. You notice there in, in verse 3, we're told that's where we find this first beatitude in, in Revelation. And the, the word there is makarios, uh, blessed is the one. And as we go through this, there's, there's three, three different people or groups that a blessing is pronounced over. The first is, blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of, of this book. So does that mean for you to be blessed that you need to read aloud the book of Revelation? Well, I mean, it probably wouldn't hurt anything. It's, it's not a, a bad thing to do. But we've got to remember the context, right? The, the context of this book, a, a message communicated God to Jesus to the angel to John written down and then it goes out to the servants and particularly to the seven churches in Asia there were more than, than just seven churches and, and so this is a message for remember seven is the number of completion this is a message for the church and really it's a message for the universal church but in those, those churches in Asia whoever would have been taking this to each congregation and maybe passing the scroll on to someone else and they, they take it to a congregation, it would have been read aloud in the assembly. Okay? And probably for the most part in houses, not church they didn't have regular church buildings like we think of church buildings in the first century. And so blessed is the one who reads aloud, who shares this message with the servants of God. Blessed is that person who goes from place to place and, and shares this word. And I don't think it's too much of a stretch for us to say that there is still a blessing for those who are willing to share the word of God. You know, we sometimes take for granted how blessed we are as a congregation to have so many people willing and able to teach God's word. 
Yes, in the adult classes, but in the, the kids' classes, in the youth classes, we have people who are willing to share. And for those of you who know, who experience teaching and preaching God's Word, and, and not just in this setting, but sharing God's Word outside of these four walls, as, as Alan was mentioning a while ago, you know that it is a blessing anytime we get to share the Word of God. And so may we continue to be people who share God's word. Uh, may we be people who teach and preach. And the fact is, I was thinking about this this past week, just when you think about the, the preaching and, and ministry standpoint in churches, people are leaving those positions in droves. And it's not just in, in churches of Christ, it's in, in churches all over the place in the West. You start trying to, to hire uh, ministers, and obviously this is not just about ministers, but it's it's hard to find them. They're, they're leaving. And uh, I think it's, it's important that we recognize that in this congregation uh, that there, there's not just Jerry and I that do ministry and preaching and teaching. This congregation is full of ministers who preach and teach God's word. And may we continue to be that kind of a congregation who are raising up young people who are willing and able to teach and preach God's word. There's a blessing in that. So blessed is the one who reads the, the aloud the words of this prophecy. Secondly, blessed are those who hear. A blessing is pronounced on those who hear the words of this book. Again, remember the context of the original hearers. These folks are in Asia. They're servants of, of Christ. And they are either experiencing persecution or they are experiencing the threat of persecution. And they need... They need to hear the words of this prophecy. They need the encouragement that is going to come through hearing this particular message. Uh, they they uh, under this threat of persecution need to hear that Jesus is victorious and that they are victorious. In him, I, I think as as we think about our context, one of the maybe the worst thing about church in the Western world is the fact that we are so comfortable. We we don't know what it means to face persecution. Uh, we. We get upset if the air conditioning is not working like it ought to be, right? Or if the, the pews aren't, aren't padded enough. It's not here, of course, but, you know, places, you know. <laughs> Our comfort, and praise God that we're as comfortable as, as what we are, but listen, physical comfort breeds physical softness, but physical uh, comfort and softness also breeds spiritual softness. And, and so... The goal is not then for us to go find some way to be uncomfortable, although sometimes that is where God will lead us, but for us to recognize that this is not normal. Being comfortable is not normal for Christianity. God's people for most of our history, for most of church history has been in times of tribulation. And listen, most Christians today in other parts of the world are experiencing persecution, tribulation, and discomfort. Remember the, the video a few weeks ago from the, the guy who was ministering in China? And, and, and I, I just, those words have stuck with me when they requested that, that they would, that he would pray that they be just like the church in America, and he said, no way will I pray that, because they were passionate, they were, they were uncomfortable, but they were, they were going hard after the blessing and after the Lord. 
And so blessed are these hearers here in, in Revelation, those who hear this word because they need the message. And finally, blessed are those who keep what is written in it, who keep. Uh, this is really the consummation of the blessing. Uh, the word there for keep is the word terio. Uh, it means guard. It means watch over. It means observe. And so we ask this question, how bad do you want to be blessed? Yes, there's a blessing that comes to the one who reads. And there is a blessing that comes to the one who hears. But the greatest blessing is reserved for those who keep, who observe, who obey this word. This is taking the message to heart and then doing something with it. And in their case, of course, it's faithfully enduring. Even when your flesh is screaming for you to give up. It's faithful obedience. Even when it costs you. And, and listen, part of it, it costs those, those original hearers of this, the, the words of this book. But listen, I do believe that we are moving towards a time when it's going to increasingly cost us to be faithful to Jesus, to keep the word. And so may we hear, may we begin to prepare for that right now. Because if we don't prepare now, we're going to fail when the persecution does come. And so there may be a time when it may cost you your job. It may cost you your reputation. It may cost you relationships. This keeping that he's talking about here, it's refusing to bow down to any other God or any person, anything else except for the Lord Jesus. And so blessed are those who keep the word. Now notice that as we look at this, this was not, I mentioned this last week, but I want to emphasize it. This is not just a message for the far future from, from, uh, from the first century. It was a message for them at that time. The things that must soon take place, that's what the, the content of this revelation is. It's preparing them for what's about to happen. There at the uh, end of verse 3, for the time is near. And he's not talking about the end of time. He's talking about he's talking about the time of tribulation and persecution. Uh, just a few verses later as John begins his, his salutation. He says, I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom of the patient endurance. It's, it's already started. They're dealing with persecution. They're dealing with having to patiently endure right then. But again, this is not just a book for back then. It's a book for right now. And so may we hear this message and be blessed as we prepare for what may be coming maybe quicker than we might think. May we be ready. By the way, I want to... Uh, didn't include this slide, but if you'll turn in your Bibles over to James, James chapter 1. The blessing is for those who read the word, who hear the word. But again, how much, how bad do you want the blessing? The greatest blessing is for those who keep the word. Well, here in James, familiar passage to us, James chapter 1, beginning in verse 22, but be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves, for if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror, for he looks at himself and goes away at once, forgetting what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. And so may we be 
not only hearers, not only readers of the word, not only hearers of the word, but may we be people who act on what we read and on what we hear. That's what the Lord's blessing is. Now, before we wrap up, and as, really as we wrap up, I want to move on. And y'all are thinking, oh no, he's about to preach a, a second half of the sermon. No, no, I'm about to do that. But I do want to read these four verses because I, I think they, they give us, they give us a, a great introduction, but they help us to be the doers that we are called to be. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of kings on earth. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, and made us a kingdom, priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all tribes of the earth will well on account of him. Even so, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Powerful words there, and I just, just want to make a couple of con uh, comments. Seven churches, and remember that's the complete church. Y'all have seen the meme probably on Facebook that says... Um, if oh, I'm going to butcher this, um, something about if the, the if Paul saw the church in a, in, a, in America, we would be getting a letter, right? Y'all y'all seen that? Well, we've got a letter, okay? It's it's the the New Testament, okay? And and we need to hear what is is spoken there. Notice that the Triune God, the Spirit, the Son, the Father, all there. All there, we see that again and again and again. And by the way, that number three, remember, that number three, big in the book of Revelation. One, two, three. It's almost like it's a rhythm, which I think it actually is. This book was to be read out loud and to be memorized. And you know, as well as I do, that when you set something to music, it's easier to remember it. Well, this has a rhythm to it that was meant to be memorized. Notice the importance of the gospel in verse 5. Notice our identity as a kingdom of priests. But don't forget he's coming. And victory and judgment belong to Christ. And our God is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. So no matter what we may be dealing with, we may not be facing persecution. Or we're not under the threat of, from the authorities to meet together, but we need to be ready for that, and two, we aren't getting through this life without some difficulties and some trials. Blessed are those who read and hear and do the word. Blessed are those who are in Christ. Blessed are those who turn their eyes upon Jesus. And so, may we receive the blessings as we pursue Jesus, if there's any way that we can minister to you, make it known as we stand together and sing. Sing them over again to me. Wonderful words of life. Let me more of their beauty see. Wonderful words of life. Words of life and beauty. Teach me faith and beauty.
life. Father, it's, it's amazing to us that you, uh, you came and were born here on this earth. Uh, you didn't have to do that, but you chose that. And you, you chose to send your son, and uh, we get to be the benefactors of that. Help us to remember these wonderful words of life and be able to, not only be able to, but to be willing to talk about them every day. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. <laughs> What these up, Mr. Dak Choda? Thank you so much. Oh, I got.